All right. I, don't, I have a choice to leave meeting. I don't think I'll pick that. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sebastian, first, thank you for uh, the welcome to this event. I've been looking forward to this for some time. And just confirm to me you're hearing me okay? We can hear you fine. Excellent. All right. So welcome, everyone. I, I said I've been looking forward to it. And I mean that because to me, I watch many of the presentations that come through uh, this group. And I know that a mix of hobbyists and professional war gamers from the military and board game designers and some digital people come here. So for me, it's a chance to have a conversation with people like me who like to play games, but also people who like to design games and people who have some professional background. So perhaps the part I'm looking forward to the most is your questions. So please do ask. So what am I here to talk about? You've probably guessed somehow, given the previous uh, things you've seen, marrying cardboard and bits in a tactical leadership RPG, and in particular about a game called Burden of Command. Now, first thing I want to talk about today is a failed talk, which uh, lucky for you, I'm not giving. So several weeks ago, I started thinking uh, in depth. Actually, I've been thinking about quite some time I was going to do this, and I was thinking, well, cardboard versus digital. What can I really say? What is the tension between these two? Surely there are certain central qualities that cardboard has and digital doesn't. And I naturally as a game and game designer, kept thinking, well, it must be some gameplay difference that really distinguishes them. So obvious things spring to mind. I think you guys can think of some ones that sprang to me. My mind were a fog of war. You know, computers have a pretty big advantage of that. But then unpleasantly, my mind thought of things like the game Ambush. Hey, you know, it, there's a lot of fog of war in the game Ambush, which is hex. You look up in a little paragraph book by hex and you get unpleasant discoveries. Uh, those of you who play chip pull, that's kind of a for, form of fog of war. You don't know what's going to appear. A lot of games uh, increasingly use card mechanisms. You don't know what events and things are going to happen to the card. So I was frustrated that wasn't the case. Now I'm an AI background guy, so it must be AI. Wow, we can do AI and digital. Unfortunately, as or fortunately, really, uh, as we all know, there's been something of a revolution in cardboard AI. There are a lot of systems out there uh, now for doing that. So that one wasn't clean. Then my 14-year-old uh, pointed out to me, well, Dad, surely real-time, right? I mean, they can't really do real-time in cardboard. That seemed really quite a good one. And unfortunately, I then thought of there's some clever ones where you're, like, you're on a spaceship and you have to solve a problem and you the timer starts, you know, and you've got five minutes as a social group based on a board game. It throws things at you. Oh, you thought that was working? Well, guess what? The engines are scotty. This is scotty. The engines are out. So I became highly frustrated with picking out the qualitative differences. And I don't think that's really the right way to think about it. So I'm going to make quite a different kind of argument about the intersection of card or the relationship between cardboard and digital. To me, it's really kind of meta qualities. What is, it's not strictly the game itself, but to me, the digital advantage. I think they're very obvious if you look at it from this frame mindset, ease of play. I mean, it's automation, right? That's what machinery does. It automates. Games automate a lot of details, especially, the uh, you know, you don't have to read the book. They teach you. They have many conveniences in what I would call ease of play. The other thing, pretty obviously, is they have reach. I mean, Crusader Kings 3, which actually inspired a burden. I hope I talk about that later. Uh, you know, my God, what a geek historical game. You're playing, uh, like, what is it, 1400s, 1500s? Europe, and now I think most of the world these days, in great depth, and they try and model the Holy Roman Empire uh, picking and so forth. And yet they reach probably millions of people. I think I'm pretty safe on saying that. Because, of course, the technology has some very basic advantages in reproduction, right? You can just instantly make copies. You can distribute rapidly. If it, people like it, it distributes instantly. Now, that's not to deny board games can have some remarkable sales. But I I think it's a reasonable claim to say that digital has the advantage of ease of play and reach. Now, there's a little problem here, and I bet those of you in the digital world can guess. Uh, it comes at a bit of a cost, right? It's actually quite expensive and time-consuming to produce a digital game. Though, thank God, you know, in general, there are engines like Unity and so forth. Uh, so, inversely, I would say cardboard the central cardboard advantage not some game quality but really the design cycle time and cost you can iterate fast in 
board games, relatively speaking, compared to digital, you can take risks because the cost, you know, footprint of them is typically smaller. Of course, it all depends what you're trying to do, but take the spirit of this. I mean, we've had quite a renaissance in terms of the quantity of war games out there of various forms of any form of game, starting with the Euro game revolution. I think I can say this with, with some experience based on I have done a board game. I did one of Victory Point Games, solitary Euro one called The World Will Hold Its Breath. And it's unfortunately not been published yet because I submitted it in full alpha and then VPG folded. I hope not because I submitted it. I shouldn't joke about them. They were a good company. Um, I thought it was a lot of work at the time. I would put in, I don't know, 500 hours. Felt like a lot of work to put this thing together. And I was only in the alpha. Uh, but <laughs> then I started doing Burden of Command. Actually, I'll come back to this slide, that in a moment. Burden of Command. And it's at least two orders of magnitude. In fact, just to have a spoiler uh, for later embarrassing, uh, my fir our first video burden of command and my brilliant understanding of the development cycle for digital, I said, uh, we released it in 2017. I said, of course, the game would be out in 2018. I think I've been slightly off on that. So there's a big difference. And what this means and what you'll hear when you look at game industry rags around digital is the big companies, it's hard for them to take risk. What sober business person takes large scale design risks when so much money is involved, especially if you're public? Now they do sometimes. I don't want to oversell this. I mean, let's bring up combat mission in the sense of, you know, it was a creative game. It's remarkable 3D mod, especially in its time modeling in great detail what's going on on a tactical battlefield. So I'm not denying digital has innovation. Of course it does. But I look to cardboard for creativity because it's so easy for you all, those of you in this community, not easy. You have some advantages in your iteration and design cycle. So there's an irony, by the way, in the combat mission one, even though I pointed to it as digital innovation, some of you may realize, in fact, uh, it started life as off a board game design, squad leader. So, but having said that, really, I do mean there's a lot of creativity, but I think there's some economics and design differences. So. My goal in this talk, then, is to stand on the shoulders of giants, namely the long conversation and tradition of innovative design in the tactical combat space out of board games, but to do it in a digital game, to draw from it, to synthesize, to add, I hope, a few new things, and to, I would say, advance the design conversation. Again, one of the reasons I'm happy to be here. And I hope increase the reach. I don't think these games here have the kind of reach that uh, Crusader Kings 3 does, nor will Burden, but I might have some digital advantages I hope will allow us, meaning this community who has design thoughts, which I will echo throughout the talk, to reach more people. And the deliberate intent of Burden is to reach the non-grognard. I hope we don't turn away the grognards, but to reach broader audiences, those who might play an XCOM or a tactical RPG, and interest in the thing that Anybody here today must love these historical settings around a military conflict. So that's my goal. Now, I want to point out most games are war are, and now I'm starting the design conversation. I'm going to paint a contrast to what I think certain traditions and board games have done uh, versus others. So how emotional are you feeling looking at this picture? I'm sure some of you recognize this digital form, but I think we can, uh, Grigsby, uh, but I'm sure we all are familiar with classic hex encounter in the space. I, I, I think actually many of us do get excited, but the ones who get excited playing these games, I bet have some historical context where it means something to them to move fourth panzer, right? Or third infantry division. Uh, but for the average person, I don't think this is an emotional contact. Inversely, my God, Call of Duty grabs you by that. Well, I'm going to be polite here. Hmm. It grabs you emotionally. and. On the beach, I remember the first time I tried it, it was shocking viscerally, sensorily, auditorially, visually. Oh my God, I felt, you know, saving Private Ryan beach scene. But there was a little problem. I, I'm running up the beach. Of course, I get shot down. Oh, you know, that's a problem. Uh, wow. 20 seconds later, I'm reborn into the game and I keep running. And it, it became very clear that while this had verisimilitude and great emotional surface oomph, 
the reality is it's a power trip. You're running around mowing down people and, and it's very fun and exciting. I'm not denying its appeal. Obviously, its appeal is tremendous. But it's some attempt to capture the emotional, at least, historical sense of uh, tactical fight, I think it's it's got some issues. I mean, I think soldiers would be quite happy to have immortal and re reset. So I want to talk about a tradition in the board games that's a little contrary to some of that. And I want to point to that conversation starting arguably, with Squad Leader in 1977 under John Hill. Squad Leader, for those of you who don't know, uh, probably most do, but I don't know who's here today. So it's a squad level uh, infantry combat game. It does have armor, but infantry focused. And it's focused on leaders, rallying units, uh, di directing their fire, destroying other units, and fighting in very small scale battles, maybe company size, et cetera. But the takeaway, look at the picture on the left. It's human scale, and yet it's also tempting to be credible. And it really did make a very compelling, you know, simulation. Many people still play and believe in uh, advanced squad leaders as sort of highly detailed simulation, or well, they recognize the limits, but as a simulation of what's going on, or at least an incredibly well-intentioned attempt to model, and for its time, a remarkable attempt to model. By the way, great game. That's the other reason it's very appealing. Now, there's another tradition, again, focusing on the human, but really from the narrative side. Uh, John Butterfield, Eric Lee Smith in 1983, Ambush, which was a, you have a paragraph book, you have a hex map. Uh, as you enter different hexes, you look up what happens there. It was in some sense trying to do D&D &D, uh, in World War II or, you know, a movie, a uh, World War II movie. And they were consciously and explicitly, I think, trying to make a Hollywood movie. So it was empathetic. It was trying to make that human connection. You you were in charge of individual soldiers that might grow or die or whatever across a campaign. But it was Hollywood, which is not a criticism. And while I'm you know focused on these cardboard design cycles, I again want to uh, emphasize I'm not denying the creativity in the digital space. I'm just again pointing it's harder for them to take the risks. But you know, Crusader Kings remarkable. My God. You know, the historical detail they're willing to indulge in in a certain period of time and yet stay human and credible. So uh, this is not something that only the tactical wargaming tradition owns, but I do think it pioneered in many ways. And I hope, David, you're here today. You said it's going to come to the talk, but um, David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin have, uh, in a similar spirit, on the left, this is uh, Castle Itter, recommended. It. It's very human scale, individual historical figures in a surreal contest where Germans were helping Americans versus SS. Very strange end of the war, true story. On the right, uh, uh, arguably an RPG card-driven or card-based game in Stalingrad. And I don't have time to go through this. I'm not going to talk about this too much today because it's in such a different design space from the tradition that I'm talking about that uh, it just be, I'm, I'm not working on that kind of approach and burden, but I do respect it and probably will be learning from it in future. I also allude to modern things in this space. American Tank Ace uh, from Gregory Smith. You are a crew in a Sherman tank, you brave people, in uh, 1944. Another very interesting design, not yet out. Bernard, I'm going to butcher the name, Grzybowski. Uh, Purple Haze, individual soldiers in Vietnam, highly narrative focused. That's one I'm very excited to get. I'll probably learn from that too. So I'm pointing tradition, human-centric empathetic, tactical leaders. And I want to talk about that space uh, on the rest of the talk and how I want to build on design insights that, for me at least, taken from these various cardboard inspirations. I will be leadership focused. Burden of Command is a leadership RPG. The goals are besides monomaniacally focusing on leadership in many different ways to be emotionally authentic, uh, to be tactically credible, to be, I didn't say authentic, I don't want to be butchered, to be credible, historically respectful. My father was an historian. It's very important to me and to the vets who serve on the project. And to broaden the audience for uh, the hobby and then the professional activities that we love. And, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact we got on the cover of Stars and Stripes, I, but I also think it speaks to maybe we're saying something, you know, connecting to some of these emotionally authentic, historically respectful qualities that uh, military people 
like. And we've had many, I'll get into the team, many uh, vets volunteer for that reason. Okay, so some of you may not know what Burton in Command is. Uh, and if you do, it's still, I think it's fun to watch the video. This will remind us. So we're going to do two videos, each approximately two minutes. One will really be sort of on the narrative side and the leadership moral side, and the next one will be tactical. Uh, and Sebastian, I'd like to know if suddenly the sounds failed me. Otherwise, here we go. We started the project, everything was black and white. Now we have 1500 color on it. Those are historically based most of our examples, not making this kind of thing up, so we might generalize it. that tradition, human focus, the narrative aspects. But trying to be sober and historical about it. Now I can see my genius leaders Here we go. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, uh, some of the more experienced that don't give a date, don't give a date. But I, of course, being a green lieutenant, knew exactly what uh, I was doing and insisted and had to eat crow for quite some time after that. So I think, at least for me, that's been uh, part of the evidence of the difference in design cycle speed, or maybe it just speaks about my abilities. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. So look, it'll probably jitter a little bit here, but give me a second. There we go. All right, now a little bit on the tactic, you will definitely see echoes of squad leader and subsequent games like that in here.
Uh, of course, he instantly got beat up by a grognard on YouTube for, you know, he didn't suppress before he assaulted the machine gun. But, you know, we had to simplify for a uh, video like this. And also, uh, you will see some more credible topics later. But grognard didn't hesitate to catch us in our errors, which I respect. But, you know. All right. Background. So I deliberately didn't start with who I am. What's the team? So I wanted to motivate you guys about what the talk's about and then so you could see if our you know background is relevant and how we bear on this discussion. So what's my background? Who the hell am I? Well, I'm the project lead, Luke Hughes. I have a master's in neurophysiology and psychology from Oxford, especially with emphasis on animal behavior. Uh, but I did things like dissect brains with medical students, think pharmacology, all kinds of strange things. My PhD was at Yale and AI, but very human-centered. I did my thesis on societal simulation, actually simulating a primate, a chimpanzee colony. How's that for a little different? Kind of early Sims. In fact, true story, I was offered Sims to do lead Sims, but in my genius, I turned it down for remarkably stupid reasons. Uh, founding director of research for Silicon Valley. So I highlight research here to point strength and weakness. You hope if I was a research director, maybe I can innovate. On the other hand, we all know those crazy researchers with their unrealistic ideas. Well, you know, I've been learning a lot of development skills in the last some years. I did also do a Silicon Valley uh, startup for a while. Uh, so I have more experience with research, but it's been a learning experience. Uh, so it's a strength and it's a weakness for me. I've been a long time gamer. I've started playing at age 12, uh, Gettysburg Avalon Hill, if anybody remembers that one. And then I was typing in games and basic code out of magazines on Wayne computers in the 1970s. Uh, board game design, you know, I have a background, though not published. That doesn't mean it'll be any good, but, you know, the publisher was excited. The world will hold its breath. Okay, it's personal for me, this project, too. My father, uh, was a lieutenant commander in World War II in the Navy. My mother was a nurse. My father went on to be an eminent historian. My justification for saying eminent, other than my natural bias, is he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and he found, found the field history of technology, which means, Dad, Mom, I feel a lot of pressure to try to be respectful on the history side. Okay, uh, the team, senior advisors. Some of you may recognize Colonel John Antle. He was executive producer, if I got it right, for Gearbox around Brothers in Arm, uh, let's see, uh, Brothers in Arm video game, which is quite uh, successful on the more credible uh, first person shooter, but credible ones. Wayne Bernhardt, 20 million copies, uh, narrative uh, novel, fiction novels. And he read all our uh, early fiction through, gave us comments, guided our writers. Uh, Professor uh, John McManus, who's an eminent military historian, he read everything we put into the game at least since early iterations, and gave us feedback. So they're not responsible, but we tried to do it right. Uh, Gordon Rotman, you may recognize. Uh, he was in special forces in Vietnam, has written many books on very specialized military. He helped us on slang and things like that. So we're trying to be historically authentic and with the writer's help, emotionally credible. We have many vets involved on the team. And unusually, it was a, a sort of design team challenge. We had to marry uh, war game designers People known for their careers in combat mission, like Mad Russian Steve Overton or Hank Stouffer's, uh, and uh, you know military experts like Steve Lore, who does a lot of our historical media, with writers like Paul Wang and Alan uh, guys who are have very highly rated games uh, of completely different domains at times that you can go check on Steam, but they're interactive fiction. They're not war games, and it took some time for us to learn to work together. But I think that speaks to what we're trying to do. We're trying to touch that human side of uh, combat. Many vets involved. This is just some of them. We had many volunteers come in on the basis of, you're trying to say something different, something people don't talk about, about the cost of war, the burden of command. And so we want to help. It's amazing how how these guys just never stop giving in gals. A uh, theory. Okay, so now I'm kind of going, I'm past sort of what's this about? I want to talk the substance of the rest of the talk. It's a leadership RPG, and I hope I can say something about what leadership is, or at least frame the conversation and help uh, us have a good conversation together. To me, tactical leadership is about being on a chaotic battlefield where FUBAR and SNAFU is the norm, and things rarely go as planned, either for physical or human reasons, in board games like this, 
Uh, I think people may recognize chaos factors. Uh, and the leader, I believe, is trying to do three things. Direct. Every war game, tactical war game known to man does this, right? Uh, order the units around. But there's some interesting things to say there based on things like fields of fire, uh, game, so forth. I'll come back to motivate squad leader, right? Get the morale going. I'll be draining all these, going through them, so I'm not going to drain this slide here. But somewhat more unusually, preserve your men, not just in the self-interest of having an effective fighting force, like, say, Panzer Corps would encourage you to, but maybe empathetically and emotionally, and maybe due to the victory conditions. So I'm going to go through this now systematically. I'm going to go up the slide rather than down the slide. Preserve. The burden, because I think this is one of the more unusual things with the game, people tell us that. So the burden of command, what is that? You know, we had a feeling for it, but over time we came to an articulation of it. So in a nutshell, we think the burden of command is the tension between mission and men. Or if you want to put it in somewhat human terms, my responsibility to my superiors, and arguably moral responsibility to the war as a commander, to achieve the mission, Versus my responsibility not get my men killed. I mean, you could just say for force preservation, but I think most commanders care deeply about their uh, their soldiers. So mission versus men. And we tried to take that tension through everything in the game, and I will try to illustrate that as we move through it. But there are secondary, corollary versions of mission versus men. Mission versus friendlies. Maybe uh, your artillery you're calling down on a house, if you do, will get civilians killed. Are you still going to do it? But if you don't do it, you may get your men killed uh friendlies right you you want to get off this ridge because you're going to get slaughtered but if you do maybe the adjacent company will get slaughtered right so it's not just your guys and then there is some moral responsibility to the en enemy remember that scene in band of brothers where uh captain winters confronts you know shooting the uh the young man he's never met before it's not easy uh to kill and sometimes there may be too much slaughter like the debate about the Gulf in the Gulf War about the highway of death. There's something like that historically in our game, which I don't want to give spoilers away, but we connect to that topic based on real history. Now, this is always a fun one to do. Those of you who have seen me do this before, uh, no shouting out in the chat box the answers. Um, and let me just go through it. This is not how it looks in the game. This was a design slide. Lethal insubordination. Friendly artillery pummels the enemy. Suddenly, your sergeant shouts the order to advance without so much as a glance your way, and definitely without your command. You bark the commander counter order. The men stumble to a halt. Your sergeant turns, bleary-eyed from drink or shock, and repeats his own commands to the men. The barrel of his rifle shifts away with a dreamlike slowness your way. Here are your choices. Shoot him before he gets my men killed. Sergeant, now is not the time for an advance. Sergeant, I am in command here. Knock the weapon from his grasp. Now, don't have time to wait, uh, but feel free to pop your answer out there in the chat or, you know, commit yourself. You're at the moment of command here. Which would you pick? Now, I have not had a single person so far in doing this repeatedly pick the historical choice when they didn't know what the historical choice was. The historical choice made by Lieutenant Spears uh, burden of, I'm sorry, of Band of Brothers fame was he shot him dead. And uh, there, I can give you a reference later. The slides will be released later. You can get the reference for that. But it's truth, I mean, history, truth, stranger than fiction. So uh, yeah, there's a men versus mission. Uh, are you going to, you know, kill a man to get the mission done? Pretty brutal. So I want to point to actually a digital game designer here. I think we all recognize this name, Sid Meier, invented Sid and many other remarkable games. And he says a game is a series of interesting decisions. I hope that you felt that that just now was an interesting decision. I can say that in a sample size I've done, nobody picked the actual decision. So obviously it wasn't obvious for most people. And I'm not saying Spears did the right thing. I'm just saying there can be different choices. Uh, and it's interesting because it's a hard decision. So I'm going to try, since I'm a research guy and an animal psychology and you know, a physiology guy, to drain that a little bit in terms of what it means in terms of game mechanics and in terms of uh, physiology as we go through this talk. So and now I get to tell my seagull story. Some of you may have heard. Uh, so I was a student uh, in, in, out on a beach in, in Scotland, 
and uh, I saw a seagull. And this is going to bear an interesting decisions. Bear with me here. So I had food. Seagull knew I had food. It wanted to get to the food, but you could see competing motivations in it. You could see that it was thinking, oh my God, you know, I want that food, but he's a predator, you know, and it's like dancing around trying to decide what to do. So it suddenly hit me that this was a laid out on a on a sort of measuring stick, right? How far away from me, competing motivations made visible. So I threw a little piece of food out. So of course, he moved closer, right? But because the food was more tempting, it was more possible. But then the tension, he kept dancing back and forth because he knew it was getting more dangerous for him. So one way I believe physiologically and brain, I can, somebody wants to ask me about this later and give more neurological justifications for this, different motivational systems in our heads compete for what decision we will make. And that, I believe, is one way you make interesting decisions. When you call on different parts of the human psyche in difficult situations, your responsibility to your men, your responsibility to uh, something more, your responsibility to uh, superiors, the shame if you uh, are fearful on the battlefield versus you know the prestige if you aren't versus the empathy for others. There are many human motivations. It doesn't have to be eating food. We have, uh, again, I worked with a, a guy who was a, a David Premack, brilliant man in uh, animal language and primates. And I worked at a primate training center. So ask me about how human and uh, complex motivated chimps are later. It's remarkable. It's very sort of opened my eyes when you strip language from us, how remarkably similar we are in some way, even to seagull. I'm not saying we're seagulls in the battlefield, but we are driven by many competing motivations from shame to anger to rage to obviously physical fear on the battlefield. Now, here's a more subtle example of uh, I, you know, the kind of narrative burden of command decisions we try to bring to bear. I don't think we've shown this publicly before. I describe it once. Mrs. Uh, and I hope you're gathering here that it doesn't have to be on the battlefield in burden of command. Mrs. Giramaldi disappears in the kitchen along with her older girls. They return moments later with what looks to be a little balls of fried breadcrumbs that have a slight orange cast. After a little discreet poking, it turns out there's rice just underneath. The inside's filled with lush cheese, tomato sauce, and sweet peas. Apologies to those with Italian-American background. Arancini, uh, Lorenzo declares as the plates are passed about by his able daughters to celebrate the festival of St. Rose. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through all the fiction in here. I'm taking snippets of it. You, as a commander with your men, are at a nice meal with a family. Uh, I think this is in Sicily. Um, but the MPs show up, and uh, there you'll hear about this. Out back of the house, the inside a big wood barn, once painted white, there are my packed, there are hay packed steps that lead to an iron door that better befits a bank full. The MPs slam a sledgehammer against it, can as much as make a dent in the iron. All right, Jeremaldi, First Sergeant Barnum says. He plants himself before the Italian patriarch and keeps a hand light atop his submachine gun. You want to explain this? It's where we hide our priceless things from thieving fascists, Lorenzo says. The two men stare at each other like doing glaciers. And as you can bet, we're not going to let you off the hook. You're going to have to figure out what to do here. Um, you step over to Lorenzo, his jaw is clenched shut and his hands are balled into fists. Why do you do nothing, Captain, he asked. These men defile my house like Kamichi Nire. They didn't hire me as a voice actor. I can't understand why. These men defile my house like Kamichi Nire. Black shirts. So here's the tension. Here's an interesting decision, a difficult one. Barnum is doing his job. The family has army goods. He's hiding an enemy soldier and belongs to a crime syndicate. They're actually mafia connected. But Lorenzo is protecting his family. And, the, and this is where it gets historically complex, that we're actually saying things that are true. The mafia were the only ones, to, well, the, the only might be an exaggeration, but the mafia were the only ones to pose Mussolini's black shirts. Moreover, some of you may know this from the Naples history, uh, more of the American army, so maybe this was Italy, not Sicily, more of the American army is going to be here a while, and local relations, yeah, it is Naples, I remember now, more of the American army is going to be here a while, and local relations need to be considered. Your black and white world of combat is definitely going gray. So basically, you can argue to the MP, you know, you can you can do it, the you know, the one way, the army way, or you can maybe try to persuade the MP uh, that, you know, 
I mean, is it so bad? They didn't, they do, they're not, you know, they're, maybe you don't want to uh, alienate the locals. Is that such a good decision, Sergeant? In fact, we even suggest maybe we could turn the family into somebody who could inform us about the people who are really distributing the goods in this area. So it's tricky. What's the right answer? And if you, even if you make the right answer, probabilistically, you might fail persuading the sergeant. And then it's a double whammy. You lose face in front of the men because you failed and they're upset at what's been done to the family that was being so kind to them. Okay, so I hope you've gotten a flavor of kinds of decisions we throw off the battlefield. There'll be plenty on the battlefield. Another thing you wanna to do to create this emotional, uh, to build on um, the tradition, the cardboard tradition from uh, things like ambush is to build empathy. So we did a lot of work. Of course, we had writers. We had a person like William Bernhard who would give us uh, you know, advice on how to make things empathetic. And we use a lot of tricks of the trade from the writing world. So anyway, let me show you a, a flavor of that. Here, we're trying to build empathy. This is one of the characters. doing all this because one of the roles of the leader is to preserve his men morally for combat strength ethically and emotionally so if you care about your leaders and we had we had some really encouraging things like some of our playtests started saying things like the things we hope they'd say like you know i didn't go up that hill uh because i really didn't thompson gotten so far in a campaign i just i couldn't see him dying 44 you know going up the hill so was it the right decision for, as a leader? I guess he'd have to say for the context, but it was very encouraging to us to make you feel that burden of command. Here's another way we do it from a game design standpoint. I think it's I think it's interesting. Some people have told us that they think it's pretty unusual. So gamers have been trained Pavlovianly, including me, to win, win, win. Take a popular simple game, you know, a uh, uh, Panzer uh, in a war space like Panzer uh, Corps, Panzer General. You know, you can't lose a scenario in Panzer General or Panzer Corps. You must win. It's all about winning. And this is beaten home. You know, the power trip, you will win everything, no matter how historically difficult. You will win. Well, that's not the real world. Um, early on, I said, you know, I was talking with vets, you know, you guys retreat sometimes. I said, we never retreat, we withdraw. <laughs> but of course, they do uh, withdraw. So sometimes it's the right thing to do. And the cotton balers, the uh, unit we fall, 7th Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division, thanks to the help of John McManus, certainly did some withdrawals. So how do we encourage a gamer from a game design? Because they're so trained to win, right? Well, the idea we had was let's offer them two ways to win. Echoing men versus mission. One way to win Looking at the top is what we're all used to. Oh, secure the enemy barracks, seize the objectives along the road, secure the eastern road. Not novel in war games. Um, below is uh, a men victory condition. Suffer no more than light casualties. On the scenario on the right, suffer no more than moderate casualties. So we score you, we rate you on both men versus mission. Now, I, this is a mechanical intent to make the player focus on... Uh, this tension in game terms between men and mission, whether to preserve their force or because they want, you know, they care. And we, in fact, have a withdraw button that as you take casualties, we pop to sort of kindly taunt, not taunt's not the right word, kindly tempt you. I still can't find the quite word. Uh, remind you, uh, you know, uh, Captain, maybe you should be considering withdrawing. Your casualties have gone as up this much, you know, and you don't lose the game if you withdraw. Now, there are consequences. If you withdraw, the colonel will certainly have an interesting conversation with you, which we handle in the narrative. Uh, it is even possible to be relieved. On the other hand, if you keep butchering the men going up the hill, uh, Sergeant Grant 
shown on the bottom uh, row, will also have some things to say to you. And you may gather from the men, they may not be able to say things as directly that, you know, they don't visit, view you pleasantly. If we do a Vietnam uh, campaign, we can think about some of the implications of that. Okay, now uh, let's look at the time. We're starting to run short. So I'm gonna do a tease here. I would love to talk about this in the questions and answers uh, segment, um, but we don't have time right at this moment. But we did work on another quality of preserve your men, which is combat fatigue, combat stress, PTSD, those kind of things. Uh, modeled off some uh, real work coming out of the war. And I'd love to talk about how we simulate that in a game, but for now, uh, with stress as well. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. But that, I personally find one of the most interesting things to have worked on. And tease, I can talk about the progression of it and how it manifests itself based on a study in 1940s fix. It's pretty famous, apparently. Um, also, how you age your men, how you talk and counsel them, uh, really RPG manage your company to uh, overcome those things. But again, that's, if you want to talk about it at the end, I'd love to. Let's move on to the next segment. Here, let's go back to the theory of leadership again. Motivate and look at board game tradition. Continue the conversation around motivating. Now, I think most of you instantly think of this game and those that followed on, and there are many that followed on. I'm just pointing to this sort of er one, the originator, a squad leader. It's all about motivating and morale. Your units have morale. They take morale checks. And I'm describing this for people who may not have played it. Um, so the central mechanic, one of the central mechanics is when you take fire, you take morale check. If you fail the morale check, if you don't fail the morale check, you're fine. If you do, you flip to broken. You can see the Germans over here having a pretty rough day. Uh, and if you then get fired again and break, again, then you're destroyed. You can also just get shot, killed outright by fire. But this is probably the more common way. And it leads to, you can see it's very psychologically, very human focus. It's not about counting bullets and hitting bodies. It's really about the morale of the men. It's such an innovation in this day. Um, you can see this would lead to certain tactical play. So there's sort of infamous tendency to do killer stacks, which is to take your best, highest round, highest firepower units, stack them up, Put your best 10 3 leader on it and you know try to uh, break again that broken unit. And so you concentrate fire. Unfortunately, and this is no dissing of squad leader, because again, what an innovation. It's not clear this is what really happens in the battlefield, even though it's a very compelling experience in the game. So an article that had a lot of influence on me uh, early on was a real role, small arms in combat. And basically his argument was. It's much more small arms, small arms. I'm not talking about artillery here. That's another interesting conversation. It's much more about suppression, not uh, breaking and destroying and part of his, and, or shooting them dead. So part of his evidence was he took firing ranges. And if you just take a straightforward firing range and you have uh, people shoot up, they shoot pretty well. But the moment you put any kind of live fire up, oh my God, the fire goes to hell. And you start seeing things, and I don't want to drag Ukraine in too much here, but if you watch things in Ukraine, you see people putting up guns, shooting above the trench, et cetera, because who wants to get killed, right? So you spray fire, and the other side certainly respects fire. And real soldiers, as I understand it, you know, they don't want to get shot, so they get down, and it gets hard to kill them. That's called suppression, right? They're putting their heads down. They don't want to stand up and get killed. You are, might be able to maneuver on them. A game, in my opinion, did it. An outstanding job of modeling qualities of this is Band of Brothers from Worthington Games, Jim Crone. And he he pushes a suppression point. It's very hard to kill units, but you can suppress them. So what that leads to is, in his view, and on my view too, a more credible battlefield. You spread your men out because, you know, you don't want stacks that could get killed, unlike in Squad Leader, that you do to get that killing firepower. You don't just constantly concentrate fire on one unit. You spread it out because you're not going to cross that street while there are units that haven't been suppressed. So, you know, you, you tend to show up in a line. You tend to suppress your side. And we try to do that in burden. So let me now show you. We try to motivate the player without forcing them. But if they want to be effective, to do the four Fs. So this is a tactical video as opposed to a narrative video.
Remember, we're always trying to push leadership. Maybe excessively, who can say? Remember, it's about suppression. It's not about casualties. That's hard to do. Ideally, you flank. They're suppressed. They do have a morale check here now. That's one of the times, both in Napoleonic and Modern, when you're about when you're about to assault or you're being assaulted, morale checks happen. And units will typically, as I, from what I've read, surrender or flee rather than do the dramatic melee that maybe is overemphasized in many tactical games. Okay, uh, another one I'd love to do, but running out of time. Again, in the spirit of men and mission, building trust to be effective on a battlefield. If you care to do that, uh, ask me about that later. I think I can say some interesting things based on uh, research. Uh, by military people on uh, what how trust is built and we simulate it in the game. And it affects morale, which is a central mechanic in our game as well as squad leader. A game, remember this? A game is a series of interesting decisions. So I want to come back to the sort of physiological, and you know I love my animals, so I've stripped things down. I've got our animal for you. Um, <laughs> so interesting decisions and biology. Now, what I really wanted to show here was a dog with a food bowl, and I went to search for that in Wiki Commons, and I just, I found this one, and I just couldn't resist it. Such an interesting picture for this poor dog. He's chained, and <laughs> I guess the chicks are trying to eat his food. I think there's some conflicting motivations for everybody involved here. But to be a little more sober, I worked with a, a professor, well, not worked, I was in his classes in McFarland, David McFarland, Oxford. He did some really interesting economics of behavior and bio, so biologically based. And, and I'm I'm heading towards a point here, so bear with me. Um, what he showed was that uh, dogs were little economists, meaning if you put food and water uh, next to them, food bowl and a water bowl next to them, they would go back and forth, back and forth uh, between the two bowls, like we might have eating a nice meal. But what was fascinating is if you put the food bowl far away from the water bowl, suddenly they reasoned very intelligently and economically about, uh, like an economist, utility theory and stuff, economic sense, about, wow, the costs and benefits of, uh, did I, I want to make sure I got it, I'm checking my slides, because I feel like I missed a slide here. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I thought, wow, weird transition, why am I mapping that to uh, the morale? Sorry, we were supposed to go here. So what we're talking now, we've done the motive, we've done the preserve, we've done the motivate. We just finished with that kind of stuff, suppression. We're in direct, right? You're ordering your units around. So I'm sorry, I lost the context. Now let me go back to the dog. Okay, so I think there's some interesting things to say about giving orders um, in the sense of getting units to do things. So now back to the biology. So what this dog would do, fascinatingly, was he would economize. He would spend much longer at the dog food bowl and inversely the water food bowl because he understood the cost intuitively. I'm not saying he's sitting there with a little calculator, but his brain was of, of making the, the trek to get the water. So what's my point? My point is that uh, animals and people, I think it's pretty clear, uh, are very sensitive to the costs and benefits of actions. A personal example back in the day as a grad student, back when we used dictionaries, shows how old I am. So. I remember sitting there and there was a dictionary above me, but I actually have to stand up out of my chair to pick up the di dictionary. Uh, and I didn't. And I started thinking about that because an AI student, you're always sort of studying yourself. And I realized I was like counting calories absurdly for the effort to get up and get the dictionary. I was probably counting the cognitive cost of having to look in the damn dictionary. Uh, we are highly sensitized as uh, evolutionary biological creatures to costs of resources and to benefits around resources. And so that bears, in my opinion, on how you make game decisions 
interesting. Here I come, go again, trying to draw from the board game tradition, in particular the war game tradition. I want to park, point to Mark Horn, Herman. He's, if he's here, I don't know if he is. He's probably a little shocked to uh, see a connection with dog bowls, but I think there is. We the People, 1993 American Revolution. Brilliance. This one, the, maybe it was the first card driven board game. The cards often could only be used one way or another. You could use it to get a general going, right? Order a general or place two political control markers or bring reinforcements. But, but, but you couldn't do them all. You had to pick one. And so that's interesting, immediately an interesting decision, right? Like for the dog, like which one do I choose? So remember, interesting decisions narratively, tension between motivations, cost counting, calculus. Interestingly, at the same time, XCOM, the original XCOM in 1994, came out completely independently, inspired by, I don't know, um, a, a similar mechanic. They had all kinds of orders for your squaddies, and they all had certain AP costs, action point costs around them. And so you had to be very careful how you spent your points to crouch, shoot, move, etc. And XCOM 2 very successful as continue that tradition they simplified it beautifully in the interface to you know two orders very visibly shown something we tried to learn from i tried very consciously in the design to make burden of command xcom like in simplicity in ease of play i'm not claiming it is i'm just claiming i tried to right so uh now ben hull uh, somebody who's been kind of talking to me at times and uh I've been quite inspired by his designs. Fields of Fire does this. So he, here you can see how many commands from my leaders. You're running a company uh, with a chain of command in World War II. You only have so many orders you'll be able to expend on your various platoons and leaders. So how are you gonna do it? And it's a very innovative game. It's a card a battlefield dynamically built out of cards. I'm sure some of you uh, watching today have played it. And my point is he creates interesting decisions around leadership and command, where will you spend your limited resource time and attention? Who are you commanding? Are you studying the battlefield? Are you talking to your lieutenants? Are you ordering direct fire? Where will you spend your leader? I try to make sure your leaders in burden of command have limited points, just like fields of fire and also XCOM, so that you have tough choices. Why order all my squad for? Or will I extend, spend points on pumping up the machine gun through bolster? Or will I instead rally one of my squads that's in trouble from suppression? Another innovation, uh, partially due to fields of fire, is chain of command. On the left here, uh, I want to thank a member of the community on Twitter for giving me this picture. Um, here's your chain of command. It's an infantry company, American infantry company, uh, modeled in uh, cardboard in World War II. We do the same thing. I'm still slightly ticked at one of the writers who pushed me to do this because uh, he said you could get empathy. People would fall, you know, get emotionally committed to platoons, first platoon, not just to Thompson or Dearborn. I'm slightly pissed at him because it's been an incredible pain in the ass. Forgive my French. Uh, implementing chain of command. Oh, my God. Anyway, probably another interesting design conversation. But we did it. And it was also incredibly hard to communicate it to people. People do not recognize platoon. We have a high percentage of our play testers, very encouragingly, come from people who played uh, XCOM, never touched a, a serious, you know, tactical World War II game. We even have interactive fiction people here from a sort of story and narrative tradition. They have a learning moment for me was when a play tester, you know, in the narrative said something like, uh, you know, you get a call from HQ and the play tester said, what's HQ? Now, I thought I was pretty aware of, uh, you know, what people is technical or not, but HQ was technical for them. So trust me, chain of command, incredibly hard to communicate. We put remarkable energy in the interface and other things to teach it. And you can see over here, third platoon, sorry, a little grainy here. Uh, so you have Dearborn activated, kind of like you might do a chip pull for those who recognize that mechanic. And you go in rounds of leadership for a particular lieutenant in charge of his squads. You as a captain can intervene. You're kind of the kingpin um, who has some advantages in helping. So. I'm actually reaching, the, I'm proud of myself. Hey, 356, I actually managed to finish slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, so a few quick things. Here's my summary. I hope that you'll consider there's something that's been said about a leadership model. How in board game mechanics, and sometimes from digital, we can confront a psychological battlefield with chaos, 
didn't talk too much about that. That's another thing I can talk about. I'm going to give you a list of things we could talk about if you want to with remaining time. Uh, Battlefield Chaos, where you must preserve, motivate, and order your men as a leadership group with a credible uh, chain of command. Emotionally authentic. I think I beat that one to death. Whether we succeed or not, and we do a lot of ratings and feedbacks and surveys, and it seems that we're succeeding, we communicate the burden of command. We worry about uh, soft issues like trust, uh, ones that I haven't been able to show you about yet, which I'd love to, combat fatigue and combat stress and PTSD. We try to be tactically credible. We draw on a tradition of board games. I only reference some. There's, there's a nice one on Player's Aid, if you're familiar with them, article where I talk about some more uh, tactical games I draw from. And there's some interesting ones that I've only studied lightly because they happened after I started my project, like 100 yards, I think has interesting things to say. Suppress, uh, four Fs, shock. I've had a chance to talk about that. When a new weapon class appears in a battlefield like artillery or machine guns, units in line of sight take shock. And I base this on a book called Brains and Bullets, now called War Games, that I think is, to me, pretty compelling study historically of the uh, battlefield psychology and the author of that has also given me advice around things like this shock around weapon shock and other forms of shock or if your leader dies units in the battlefield line of sight burning command will take shock as i hope they would historically respectful didn't talk too much about that today but we've worked really hard with john mcmanus i said reading the content withdrawing our events <clears throat> tightly or loosely uh, from history especially from the cotton balers uh we put book notes we had the temerity to put book notes in a game so there are footnotes about i think especially the ones you're thinking oh my god they finally went hollywood we would love to put book notes in and say that the strange hollywood moment was a real moment in history and reference it and uh 1500 uh, uh pictures lovingly colorized and edited by a bunch of volunteers we have a lot of volunteers we're a small team about one and a half programmers about maybe three full-time equivalent people uh, and many volunteers uh, helping us do all these photos and narrative and historical research and scenario design and so forth. And then I hope you've seen that within this space, I've been trying, uh, I didn't talk as heavily about this, to do the ease of play. Uh, I study very heavily successful games like XCOM in terms of their techniques. We want to talk about that. It'd be, be fun to talk about that too, to try to make it convenient, easy to do these tactical things that take quite a few counters sometimes and say squad leader and reach. Obviously I'm trying to do it in a digital space so that we can reach out to people who maybe haven't had a chance to connect to the people who served in World War II or by implication to modern vets and what they go through, not to experience it, but to point to it. I don't claim we're delivering the burden of command. I only claim that we're trying to open the door and point to it in the ways described here. So usual drill here, um, you can find me in various places. We have YouTube, Twitter. Uh, we have 92 U uh, videos on YouTube. I find you'll be happy to hear they're all two minutes or less length. We have other designs. I'd love to hear people's comments from our designs they think I should be paying attention to, though we're in late alpha. So we're not changing things but for this past, but maybe in future. And anyway, just be fun to talk about 100 yards of game you think is very compelling some mechanics. Uh, I did a recent combat morale podcast. That was an honor. There are many historians and military people in that one. I got to talk in great depth about some of the morale uh, mechanics in combat and burden of command. I will leave you with this teaser of topics we could talk about. You could ask me about. I'd love to talk about them. I'm trying to be respectful of your time. This one, I think, is an unusual one. I will claim, and I think I can make a good argument, the war is spiritual. And I don't mean quite what you think I mean, but I do mean wars as spiritual. I love to talk about combat fatigue, combat stress, PTSD, as I mentioned. Chaos in the battlefield and fog of war. Uh, trust. How does that work? What credible models are there out there? And how does it matter in burden? Realistic morale checks. It's an interesting topic. What are the actual morale checks? I mean, who the hell knows, right? But what's the evidence for what might be the actual morale checks that are experienced in the battlefield? Uh, for instance, the um, Band of Brothers board game board game that I referenced earlier does not make you take a morale check at all. Uh, when you take fire, you only take morale checks when you try to do things. It's a very interesting model. Now, that's not my 
my basis for what the real ones are. Again, it goes back to this uh, Brains and Bullets book, but I can talk about that. I have slides for all these things and videos, any of them appeal. Uh, we do have an interesting mechanic, uh, uh, and David Thompson uh, gave me permission to use this term. I love uh, referencing his game series, Undaunted, uh, in the spirit of, you know, sometimes suppression doesn't work, especially against elite troops and veteran troops. Why don't they get suppressed? What's the evidence, and, and what's the psychological theory for it? And we model it for experience in elite troops and uh, burden of command. I'd love to talk about that one. It's based on a neat uh, World War II uh, autobiography. And shock, I alluded to that. And then if anybody wants to talk references, I've been focusing on game references, what books I drew on, rightly or wrongly. I'd love to hear books you think I should be reading. I hope I've read some of them and we can talk about that. So uh, yes, that is the end. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Sebastian. And it's been a privilege to uh, have your time. Hey, Luke, we have a couple questions. The first question says, do you factor in casualties among the enemy attempting to surrender, which is a very dangerous thing to do on the battlefield? Do I factor in casualties? I'm not sure I understand the question well. We certainly have casualties. We certainly have surrender. And when units surrender, uh, they are considered to... Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll talk around it, and the person can type more to uh, clarify if they wish. Um, so casualties, I define, you know, the technical definition of casualties is not death, it's wounded, uh, it's it can be KIA. We also essentially treat uh, surrendered as casualties. Now, and, and if your units, if one of your units surrenders, they will there will be stragglers who come back because it's rare to lose everybody, um, but it is treated as casualties. Now, I'm slightly cheating line here because i didn't expect to say this but there's a there is a, a bug in the current version that's not going to go away for the first version where we didn't really we we miss only counted casualties uh for determining men versus mission whether you're going to lose with men we didn't count surrenders happily or wrongly the americans uh, your side don't surrender too often so it doesn't matter too much in practice but in the future versions we will absolutely count uh surrenders as casualties now if you're referring instead to you know um Saving Private Ryan, situations of shooting prisoners and so forth. That's a different issue. Things like that we do address. I probably need to get the writers to say exactly the way. But we do, those kind of topics do come up. Let's put it that way. I don't know if I addressed the question because I wasn't quite clear on it. So the next one. Not. So next one says, how do you elevate the impacts of morale and leadership to the operational level? Do the tactical level paradigm scale uh, that you're talking about uh, scale to, say, a battalion commander? Well, we only are at the company level, and I so I think what I can say to the next level up is thin. However, you do have uh, indirect morale effects. Uh, for instance, the con you can make decisions that will help the men or not, which bear on your, uh, your superiors in terms of, this is where the fiction is extremely useful. You know, with fiction, with interact, uh, it's not called fiction, narrative uh with a narrative you know if you wanted to you could land martians which i hope we don't do but more credibly you can do things like negotiate with uh the next level up in the chain of command battalion etc around supplies around reinforcements around will you get uh support of the kind you need um so there's a lot there's a i shouldn't exaggerate there's quite a bit of usually pre the tactical fight and sometimes after negotiations uh, done personally and directly with your superiors around such issues, as well as, of course, getting your orders. Um, and we do a lot of, quote unquote, interesting decisions where probably pushing realism a little bit here in the negative sense. You know, you can either have recon or you can have artillery or you can have reinforcements. You know, was it that clean? I mean, obviously, the, the superiors would typically want to give you everything you want, I hope. But for game purposes, we probably exaggerate that where you have to make an interesting decision. We also model morale, again, at a level like logistical above uh, the, the battlefield in that John McManus has written you know books on this and he emphasizes that morale is affected by non-combat things too, like fatigue, right? Or, you know, and sleep deprivation and uh, food and weather. So we model that in the following sense that if you're in 
um, you know, uh, the winter in the war or something in a brutal area in Europe, uh, then you you may uh, be taking all your units may take a morale uh, suppression hit. We just model a suppression hit uh, for simplicity at the beginning of the battle to represent that. Or oh, this is a fun one. So the Americans, frankly, uh, really were learning on the job when the cotton balers landed in Operation Torch around Fadal in Morocco. And uh, there are many foobars and snafus. One of them was supplies were not keeping up, which is always hard with the uh, company. And so the historical units suffered from low supplies, which we model as uh, a morale effect on your units, units as they move towards Casablanca. By the way, one of the neat, fun things for history geeks, like the people know all this project, is we sent a uh, archivist into the National Archives to go through the Cotton Baylor records. And she got a bunch of photographs we use, some of them never seen before. Uh, also, and we will make them all public eventually as a service. And also we um, we we digitized and I later OCR them, you know, optical character recognition, the actual uh, after action reports, which early in the campaign, there were a lot of captain level reports. So we can actually read what the captains were saying was going on and what they were experiencing. I'll tell you, uh, sort of a logistical battalion issue, one of the learned lessons was, and I'm only laughing slightly because I'm sure it's right, one of the learned lessons from Morocco was more coffee. It's in the list. I could show you the, the report, but I, I bet it, it was a good advice. So things like that, and of course, more bullets and stuff like that, never you know underestimate the importance of logistics. So, But I don't want to claim we're modeling up the, up the chain of command or what's happening at the battalion level. Now, I have some ambitions in the future. I think you could do some fun things around certain campaigns where you know, your company might have some influence on how the battalion's doing, you'd hope, right? And vice versa. And maybe you'd have some choices to make at the higher levels. So we point to it. We do have influences. There is that interact. There's a lot of interaction with the battalion, but it's all in the context of you being a company commander and early on a lieutenant. The next question asks: Is it tactically credible for the enemy, uh, for example, for the German army, the pension for quick counterattacks? Is it tactically credible? Is that the question? For the enemy force, essentially. Uh, well, they certainly did that, as I understand it. Uh, we have. Uh, some pretty good experts who I know claim they're professional stories. We do have a professional story in looking over things, right? But we also have some guys, especially from the wargaming and combat mission side, who are obsessive about reading the reports and so forth. Um, they did do that. It became a liability at times because you knew they were going to do it, right? And we do we do bring the... Um, okay, I guess this is a spoiler, but <laughs> we do uh, at least one scenario I'm aware of do simulate that. Uh but I won't tell you which scenario today. So uh, you'll have to wait and find out unpleasantly. It's actually a very interesting moral situation too. But yes, we do try to model that. Uh, by the way, just to talk on the AI side, I can't resist a little bit. I didn't put that in a list. I should have, you know, I'm an AI background guy. So, and I said, I did that weird chimpanzee colony simulation. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how you could model emotions in terms of AI systems and to be, simple-minded about it, but I'm not sure wrong. I would say that emotional systems are utility analysis. They're basically cost and benefit analysis of, hey, uh, you know, is it worth attacking here? So if I, let's make that concrete to get to the like German counterattack. The AI sits there and there's an AI that will try to run a German counterattack. And it sits and says, hey, you know, how quote unquote fearful do I feel of taking casualties or being highly suppressed? Obviously, it doesn't really feel that in some literal sense. Uh, but it scores things like, because, you know, physical fear is about, I don't really want to get injured. Um, it scores the chance of its units getting taking casualties, right, or suppression. It scores a chance of success. You could sort of view that as an emotion, you know, an ambition or a, 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 a motion of sort of trust towards others' responsibility. That's a very tricky one. We'd have to talk a little longer about the emotional quality that is. But the ambition, let's just call it that. Ambition to uh, to gain the target. Uh, what do you think your chances are of achieving that? And so the AI is dynamic in the sense that it's constantly scoring, in some light senses emotionally, I would argue, uh, whether it's a good idea or not for the units. It does it by command, right? So given platoons doing it, the company as a whole is doing a little bit. I don't want to oversell it. It's not 
there's limits to it, but it is dynamic. It is utility based. And so uh, is it a good idea for them to do that? I don't think I'm qualified. I wish John McMahon is here to say, was it a good tactic for them to do it? My guess is it was a superb tactic against non-veteran units uh, when they were fighting uh, early armies that hadn't encountered them before, you know, uh, the, the French or Polish or Russian early on, uh, and probably the Americans too. It was probably a superb tactic. Uh, later, I suspect it might have been counterproductive, but I don't know. So another uh, question asked, do you model physical fatigue over long missions? Uh, and let me back up quickly. You know, one way we probably do capture it is, you know, if you just captured a hill or something, your unit should have a fair amount of suppression casualties. And when they take casualties, it's of a long-term effect for the rest of the scenario on their morale. And so if the Germans counterattack then, in principle, it could be pretty bad for you because you've been beaten down and you haven't had a chance to rally the force. That was probably a lot of driving of the question. So I hope I answered it. So uh, ask that question again, please, Sebastian, the new one. Do you uh, model physical fatigue over long missions? Not directly in the sense of simulated model. Uh, we do model it in the abstract sense of uh, the writers are free to do as they see fit, but it's usually for the setting of the battlefield. Things that I would love to model, uh, but we didn't. So truth in advertising here, rather than, wow, we did it all. Um, we don't model fatigue. Uh, we don't model a wonderful limited resource issue from a game design standpoint, you know, limited uh, ammunition, so forth, running out, which is a real issue. And uh, people certainly get emotionally excited about that topic and people get killed trying to get supplies. And I would love to have done that. Um, and, you know, something I didn't talk about today could be a whole nother talk is this tension between game and simulation. First and foremost, we do aim to be a game in a sense of an, not in a sense of being fun, but in a sense of an engaging experience about the burden of man. We ha handle some pretty rough topics, we, very respectfully, we hope. But we're not trying to be fun, but we are trying to be engaging. So in that sense of game, we do make compromises. So there, you know, we'll never compete with combat mission on their level of modeling of uh, the details of the battlefield, which is no slight on them. It's a compliment. Uh, but because we're trying to keep the audience broad, right? There's, if I, my feeling was simplicity in design where I can manage it while hitting the central principle so that XCOM players would be willing to do something that touches on the credible qualities of running a company in World War II. But I am confident that we will disappoint many grognards on many fronts. I mean, Jesus, they wouldn't be grognards, would they, if they, if I didn't, uh, or we didn't, but uh, they, it's, some of those disappointments are deliberate and conscious. We're, we're, we're aware of uh, things like not modeling ammo or uh, physical, and maybe it wasn't the right decision to not do it. Another interesting one, just to talk about as a designer for a moment, and I may still change this eventually, is when you look at real suppression on the battlefield, it's pretty clear that what goes on is the NCOs inside the squads are actually rallying the men. The men are self-rallying to some extent. Uh, these days it would be women, but you know, I was doing World War II, men and women, but so I just simplify here. Uh, the men are self-rallying and it's really not quite so squad leadery with the lieutenant wandering around or whatever the head of the platoon is fixing everything. It's a nice fiction. I left that fiction in for a couple of game, uh, engagement design reasons. It is a leadership RPG, so I really wanted to push doing things with the leader. Secondly, uh, I wanted you to always have tension between interesting decisions. So you're thinking, Jesus, I, as the leader, need to go rally those men, but I need to be pushing the attack forward, but I need to be helping the machine gunner direct fire. You know, it, I wanted that tension. And if I let the unit self rally, which they do, then that would might reduce the tension. I, I'm still, and the Band of Brothers board game does allow them self rally. That is more credible than what I do, we do. So, you know, there are plenty of, decision limits there. What I hope is we point to the, the shape of the battlefield, that leadership matters, that psychology morale matters, that there are long-term factors like the combat fatigue, uh, that things like trust and leadership, and that we we do on the core around leadership, I, I can defend, I'm not saying be right, but I can defend them. There's a basis in which we did the suppression model. There's a basis in which we did the trust, basis in which experience is gained, so forth. Um, I feel like I missed slight element there just repeat the question then we'll go on i felt like there's one more thing i want to say around that 
What was the question? It was essentially about you know, fatigue and so forth. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so, yeah, question. I won't go on. There are plenty of things like that. I think it'd be fun conversations about which ones we should have done that we didn't. And I've given you a flavor of making uh, difficult choices sometimes to remember we have a digital goal here, broaden the audience. We're not trying to beat uh, the most direct simulation. We're trying to be a leadership RPG. We're not in the end, I'll be straight. We're not a war game. We're a leadership RPG. We're trying to paint what it was to be a leader on and off the battlefield. Sometimes it's in with the uh, Italians at dinner. Sometimes one of the most stressful things due to those bastard writers I dealt with was when I got cute, logistically speaking, tried to take some uh, gas, you know, wink, wink, from the free French late in the campaign. And that was one of the most stressful situations. They worked me for a long time. Free French police started showing up. It was very, very exciting. So, and we even point towards paperwork. We did not make you go through lots of paperwork, but we do point towards the experience, letters home, things like that, to paint the role playing, what it was like to, in, to point at what it was like to be a company commander. We're not trying to be the next better tactical board game, but a war game. But we obviously draw on that tradition and I hope benefit from it. So next question says, do you model unit cohesion and what makes elite troops elite? Ah, good, good. Um, okay, there's whoever asked that question, I, there's slight entrapment there. There's lots of very interesting debates go on. Some of them I've seen in talks here on what is cohesion versus morale and uh, it's very complicated. There's also some wonderful board games uh, on uh, Civil War, uh, blanket game, the Gettysburg one. Somebody can type it in the channel, please. Great designer, uh, he'll come to me in a moment, but he worries about, it's like miniatures and cardboard, but he worries about unit cohesion versus morale and so forth. We simplified in a sense that uh, we use one, again, remember this engagement game design broader audience, morale, Morale, when I use the word morale, I don't just mean psychology. How brave are they, right? How willing to take risks? I mean, how experienced are they, right? Because what you see with real soldiers and animals, back to my animal background. So take a cat, snap your fingers in front of the cat. Ear goes like this, keep snapping. Ear stops and eventually so twitching, might not even pay any attention eventually. We habituate, soldiers habituate. So, uh, you know, uh, cohesion, uh, morale is trying to capture the sense that veterans, right, they have habituated to war. They're not as stressed by it, right? So experience as units do gain experience. And then we steal from so Panzer General, they gain five stars experience. Leaders gain experience and trust, which influence morale checks. And so how, to the question, how do we model elite units? First, they become more combat effective. Right, they pass their morale checks increasingly. They get more movement because they're more experienced, because presumably they can use cover more efficiently and quickly, and they're not as afraid of doing it. Um, they and then I think this will interest, and then of course they're fire effective and they will tend to win initiative. I define initiative as in small arms as winning the struggle to achieve fire superiority. It's not who shoots the first bullet. It's who achieves fire superiority. And it, you want to win that and burden the command and the leader's key and the, the eliteness or experience of the unit. One of the mechanics we came to late, which uh, I thank you for that question. And there's a video out there on this, Undaunted. So I was reading this book on the 82nd. Let me see if I can get the title while we're sitting here. I have my references later. Let's uh, see if I can jump to that slide. Um, this is on the spiritual stuff that would be interesting to talk about. Where are my books? Stop that. Okay. Oh, I should never have made this mistake of going through the. Okay, that was dumb. Uh, I'll, let me get out of slide mode. Is that going to kill me? Am I going to do horrible things to myself, Sebastian, if I get out of slide mode? No. Okay, I did it. See, you got to take initiative. Here we go. All right. So uh, is it in here? Um, ah, after all that, I don't think I have the book in. Is that true? Damn. Oh, there it is. Thank God. All right. Uh, James McGillis. He was a Medal of Honor winner, Greek American. Um, I was reading his autobiography, Paratrooper 82nd. And, and I just want to make sure I didn't break something. Sebastian, can you still see in here? Yes. Okay. So 
it was very interesting to read because they're in uh, Operation Market Garden and they had to cross the River Vol, uh, which was open, of course, because rivers are, and there's highly fortified, uh, you know, with a lot of machine guns, et cetera, Germans on the other side, and they were crossing the water and they're taking a lot of fire and they got across. And my model should say, Jesus, these guys, right, at the time, very they should be very suppressed, right? I don't do morale checks. Typically, right, you do suppression. They should just hit the ground and sit there. But they weren't. And they kept going. And they actually beat the Germans there, countered any, what anybody expected, given the situation. And they just went across their field, and they beat the Germans. Germans surrendered. How? Why? So I reread that section carefully quite a few times trying to understand why, what was wrong with my model versus what was going on. And I started noticing language from uh, Magalis, like rage, anger. He said things like, I just wanted to get across that field and kill the bastards. And so it hit me, of course, you know, there's another emotional quality. There's, there's fight and flight. Suppression is kind of a form of flight, right? Except you hit the ground, because if you're smart, you don't run away, they shoot you in the back, you hit the ground. Um, another reason that you tend not to get killed when you're suppressed and burden of command when you're suppressed it's hard to cause casualties because you're keeping your head down anyway um the anger the rage you know connected to the cohesion the trust loyalty of your fellows for your friends that have been killed um kept him going and so actually we have a mechanic called undaunted so as you get late in the war and your units and your leaders get high experience they can actually shrug off suppression and essentially like a classic morale check in one of the uh, squad leader uh, traditional board games. They're running across the field. They're elite. They take suppression. There's a limited amount of suppression that always happen because, you know, you are going to put your head down when you're taking fire, no matter how ang angry you are normally, unless you're berserk, right? Um, and they will make them, but after a certain point, they'll make morale checks. And if they make the morale check, they pass. They will keep going. They will take no suppression doesn't prevent them from taking casualties. They're not Superman now, but they won't take suppression. Of course, they do take casualties. The morale checks get harder. Uh, but yeah, you take a high quality veteran elite, you know, burden to command. You couple it, especially with a high, here now I'm giving you game cheats. You couple with a, a high quality leader. Uh, they, if they bolster, which is needed to sort of convey their, uh, their leadership qualities to the unit to motivate it, uh, and also to put the, the game player in attention of how to spend his orders. If they bolster the unit, its morale goes up even further based on the trust, not the experience of the leader, the trust of the leader. It'd be fun to show the video on how trust works if anybody wants to know. And uh, you can get a very strong, in terms of undaunted unit that will cross that field. Now, you may regret using your wonderful lead unit that was willing to cross the field because they will still stop bullets. So uh, be careful of abusing the leadership and unit quality you may have built up. I think- ah, uh, And there's a cohesion. Yes, improving yeah. the cohesion. <laughs> so the, we have two last questions, um, which I'll let you okay. respond to, which is one is a broad question, which is what is the status of AI in digital wargaming? And the last mm. question will be, what different effects do you include uh, from contact with hidden enemies, such as snipers, mines, firefights, and so forth? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me start the second one first. It's a little easier. Um, <laughs> so I wish we'd have time for sniper units. We'll get them eventually. We don't have it uh, directly modeled. It's just, you know, we do want to get the game out, but I wish we had snipers. We do model them indirectly. The fiction can always do things. Uh, same with mines. Um, we do have minefields, and I, boy, I'm struggling to remember after all these years of the work of whether or not... They literally model, but I can tell you a story. We do model in a sense of, we have a pretty sophisticated scripting engine. It's based on uh, Ink Engine, which was uh, done with 80 Days Interactive Fiction, but then I build a lot of stuff into it that it basically can manipulate the game as well as do fiction. So the fiction and the engine are very tightly coupled. So the scripting engine watches everything that's going on. It's a, it's, it's a bit of AI. I use some things I learned from AI. It's sort of pattern matching against everything you're doing, saying, Let's keep it simple, like ambush. Oh, did they go into hex 32? You know, oh, well, I know there's a minefield in there, so I'm going to pop this event. That's pretty trivial. The the pattern matching can watch where they are, what their morale level is, what action they're doing, uh, even 
think, you know, what units are German units nearby? I mean, really, it kind of frightened me what the leaders thought of, I mean, the writer thought of doing, it made my life painful, but it was good creativity. Anyway, minefield story. You'll appreciate this, whoever asked the question. <laughs> so remember, we have a large percentage of our players. I would say we're only about 25% of our uh, play testers are grognards, uh, surprisingly, but gratifyingly. I love grognards. I at least like grognard, but I really want to reach the other audience also. Um, <laughs> a lot of them had their idea of sort of uh, tactical combat with something like Company of Heroes. So it was confusing them that tanks go, you know, boom, as opposed to bleed slowly from being hit. Uh, but also, we had a learning experience with a scenario where we had a minefield on the road. And, uh, of course, it wasn't marked. For some reason, Germans didn't want to mark where the minefields were. Can't explain it. So uh, they move across the road. Their tank gets blown up. And this this share of the audience were really pretty pretty pissy about how unfair this was. So, of course, the Grognard group were like, well, yeah, uh, Germans didn't want to be fair. But we realized this was, from a game design standpoint, an important learning point, right? We're not here to beat them up and make them feel stupid. We That was a teaching moment, right? So that's a moment for to give them a sense of what really happened, right? That, you know, if it's an easy way to go, like a road uh, that through the forest, well, guess what? The defense, German probably figured out it was an easy way to go, too. And they're laying down fields of fire. And you start to learn, boy, probably the last place I want to go is down the road right now. But of course, if you don't go down a road, the terrain will slow you down. So the minefield, what we learned to do as a teaching moment was when, when we had we did a lot of survey feedback, both written from people and numeric scoring things. But and then we talked to them every week. We found a lot of play testing cycles, and we we understood that this minefield was upsetting to people. So rather than saying stupid, oh, they don't really know how it was, we thought, oh no, no, this is educational for a company commander, right? So what we do. The narrative engine, after that happens, not by chance, Sergeant Grant pops up, says, you know, I can't remember what he says exactly. But is this something in the spirit of, you know, it sucks the way the Germans put these minefields on roads, doesn't it? I guess we're going to have to avoid the roads in the future, you know, just beating the point home a little bit. One of the, I've watched a lot of game design videos, read a lot of books, uh, making me a good designer. I've just been humbly trying to learn. One of the things they say, you know, the AAA studios, they watch for mistakes quote unquote right where's the player not doing a successfully effective thing because that's a teaching moment right especially when people fail they get very interested we we manipulate people in the tutorials and set them up a little bit where they cross the open field like that first tactical video and they get whacked by the game by the referee and they're pissy about it like that's not fair you kind of told me to do that but again we're doing that teaching moment right well maybe you need to think independently of using cover they don't forget the moment because of learning moment and we had a last point in that, then I'll go to the next question. We had a guy who was smart, tact, uh, you know, XCOM like player, that kind of stuff. No experience, World War II stuff. It was great to see him evolve as a sort of a commander. I mean, by the end, he was really, he got very effective. He really learned, you know, how to avoid the roads, to predict where the enemy probably put the fields of fire, et cetera, et cetera. So, Answer short answer then is we do a lot of those kind of things again. The fiction gives us tremendous freedom, and the pattern matching engine. I'm going to transition to the AI question now. Inside the fiction engine gives the writers and the scenario designers, and there are some one and the same in many ways, uh, a lot of flexibility to do all kinds of things. So now to the AI uh, again. Our AI is utility. Uh, I know the question wasn't strictly what our AI is. It's state of game AI. So what well, I'll just mention, ours is a utility AI. Uh, there are some nice videos on YouTube on utility AI. Uh, there's a game AI, something like that. Really great video series uh, out there on these kind of things. Uh, ours are more flexible than usual decision trees. I'm talking shop a little bit here. Uh, like animals, I believe our AIs look around at all possibilities pattern match to which are possible rather than following a rigid sort of choice series and then make utility analysis choices. I'm not claiming it's brilliant AI, but it has some good qualities like flexibility. Now, AI in general in the game industry, uh, the dominant in the past with these decision trees, which is kind of like, do you want to turn, you know, do you want, you can either fire or move. If you move, then I'd have to go back and, being a little tired now, you know, it's basically yes or no. You make one choice, it takes you to another choice. 
and you just pick coherent things. You know, did you just see an enemy? Do you want to run, shoot at her? Do you want to hide? If you hid, do you want to keep your head down or do you want to spoke up and shoot for the first person shooter? Things like that. It's sort of it's smart. It's very fast. And it it does the coherent things in the context. Those have been dominant. Things are shifting. There are more utility uh, AI, like I just described. Of course, the uh, the the elephant in the room is the machine learning stuff that's going on. Uh, I did a little machine learning. This is things by machine learning means things like Chat GPT. Um, there's increasing amounts of that starting to happen for obvious reasons. Go talk to Chat GPT. It's not hard to do technically if you haven't. You basically just wipe things to it. It is frightening what it can do. I had it compose Shakespearean poems on burden of command. I use it to help me code now. It's remarkable, but it's tricky. My short version of machine learning, they're only starting to put the machine learning as I understand it into behavioral. It's very tricky stuff to do. It also depends. There is more there's machine learning around, uh, damn, GMT games. Uh, the person they, the people they work with for their board game implementations digitally, they use some machine learning. Uh, to have the game, the AI learn how to play uh, uh, the board games. Um, but I'm sorry, I'm blanking the title. Maybe somebody can write it in the uh, the chat. Um, so that's starting to happen. Uh, there's some nice demo videos out there. Like, I mean, the obvious thing that could be done is open world RPGs where every NPC is a chat GPT with certain goals and freedom to talk with you about anything. Now, I'm going to stop going to drone on too long. The obvious superior quality of the machine learning systems is their remarkable, what can I say, flexibility and adaptability in responding to random questions that you say to them and chatting with you about anything. It's frightening, frankly. Um, but their danger is exactly that too. They're, they're from a game design. That's a broader question because they are dangerous too. Um, their ability to respond dynamically uh, uh, to what you do means they're hard to control. Yes, I would take a, a warning lesson for us as a society from that. Uh, they're going to make strange decisions on the highway as driving cars. They're going to make strange decisions sometimes, talking in chat GPT. They're going to make strange decisions if you release them in games. But overall, probably it's the way of the future. Uh, because they will be so much more effective and flexible. And I believe I've seen some things going by recently, uh, some of the war professional wargaming community, maybe somebody here today is doing a chat GPT for putting together uh, war plans for battle situations, sort of teaching all the things around that. I mean, it is stunning what it can do, but it's hard to control and design too. Um, maybe we'll try to do some of that eventually. Now, I don't claim to be the expert on the state of the art there, uh, there's also a lot of interesting activity in board gaming AI, but that's a different topic. So, Luke, um, as we approach the end, I want to thank you from the Georgetown University Board Gaming Society for your presentation. It was fantastic. Um, oh, and fun. I know lots of people have been saying how, how much they enjoyed it in the chat. So thank you again, and ho hopefully we'll host you again. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Uh, you know, I think you can see I and the team, we care about it. This is a passion project. It isn't obvious uh, for many different reasons. And it's been a very deep, engaging experience to work with vets and historians and artists and writers and game designers, people from so many backgrounds. There's so much to bring to bear. And I can tell you this game is not my creation. It's the team's creation now. And that's a standard crappy thing to say. Everybody says it, but it is true. I mean, oh my God, the game is so different from what I envisioned it from being. Also from the playtesters' feedback, maybe not quite as fun. But I love talking about these things to people, learning from them. You can see I've tried to stand on the shoulder of giants consciously, uh, uh, trying to learn from them. I resisted so long, I have to uh, make one final joke, which is I do wonder about the wisdom of my, if you think about this metaphor seriously, about the wisdom of my standing on cardboard giants. But let's hope they were built with good geometric principles. So. <laughs> <laughs> they won't collapse under me. But seriously, I do admire the creative cycle in board games uh, and not just in the war games. And I continue to humbly learn from them and hopefully reflect some of them into the digital space. And thank you all for engaging me in such inter with such interesting questions at the end and for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, Luke. Bye-bye.